All right, now, as I mentioned, you, you just even my prayers, this is not a pleasant story at all. It's not, not, a, not a fun sermon to preach. This is not, you know, the edifying, uplifting sermon type that, you know, maybe similar to like what we were preaching this morning or at other times. This is not, not a fun subject, but it's dealt with quite a bit and it's very serious. Obviously, this is the story in 2 Samuel 11 of David committing adultery and having her husband killed. It's a very, 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 very serious sin in the Bible. It's very grievous. And it's one of the reasons that we need to look at this is, you know, David is described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. David was a great man of God. He did a lot, a lot of great things for God. He, 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 had a, he did have a good heart. Overall, I mean, this is this is an extremely horrible thing that he had done in his life. I mean, it's inexcusable. It's, it's something that, that is not looked down. And that's why the last verse in this story says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. You better bet it displeased the Lord. And we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, again, not, not a pleasant subject, but let's, let's get through this. We need to know this. Uh, lives and marriages are being destroyed today. There's, there's divorce is, is rampant, and adultery is, is, is abounding. Adultery is, is happening more than ever in this country, more than it ever has. We need to make sure that our families are together and that we can live and have our marriages last forever, for until death do us part. That is what we need to do, and adultery is one of the worst sins that I can think of that a person can do to another person. And, but we're going to get into this a little bit. Let's dig into this story. We're just going to kind of dig into everything here. Verse number one says, um, we're going to see how this even started to come to pass, right? Pass. Verse number one says, and it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle. So saying normally, right, there's, there's, a, there's usually, especially back then, there's like a break in wartime with really bad weather, you know, wintertime and stuff like that. There's typically not going to be as much fighting going on. But this is the time, it says, when kings, do, when kings go forth to battle. And don't forget, these days, too, um, it used to be that way in this country. It used to be that way all throughout history where leaders of countries would lead people into battle. If there was a war that had to be had, you know, like George Washington, the first president of the United States, what did he do? He fought in the Revolutionary War on the front lines. He directed people. He was involved in the combat. That's why the president of the United States is supposed to be called the commander-in-chief. He is the one leading the, that's supposed to be leading the military. Now they sit behind their, their you know, in their White House and, and let everyone else go off and do the dirty work for them. But back when people had integrity, the leaders, the kings, they would go out to the battle. They would go out and lead and charge the battle. Now they wouldn't necessarily be in the hand-to-hand, -hand, you know, right up at the front line, but they would be in the battle. They would be in the midst and they'd be leading it and directing it and making sure everything was going on the way that it ought to be. And here we see David. This is the time when kings were to go forth to battle. He stays home. And um, it says that David sent Joab. Joab was basically his general. Je Joab was the, the one in charge of, of the military, in charge of the army. So he sends Joab out and his servants with him. It says, in all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still in Jerusalem. So David just hung back. So, okay, you guys go off to the war. I'm just going to hang back here. Now, his job as king was he should have been out there. If they're going to be fighting the wars, the king needs to be there. Um, that's what he should have been doing. So the first thing that happens in this story is not doing what he should have been doing. Look at verse number 2. It says, And it came to pass in an evening time, time that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful looking. So here's David. It's the middle of the night. And he just gets up out of bed. He's like, oh, I can't sleep. Yeah, you know why you can't sleep? Because you're not doing the work that you're supposed to be doing. People who have a problem falling asleep are not the people that are out laboring and doing all kinds of hard work. And I'll tell you what, when I work hard all day, when I go out so when I'm digging into whatever, whatever it is that I'm doing, when I lay my head down to go to sleep, I don't have a problem going to sleep. There's no problem. If you are spending your days, if you are busy, if you are hard working and, and really working hard, when you lay your head down to bed, you are not going to have this problem of, oh man, I'm tossing and turning. I think I'll just get up. I think I'll just go take a stroll on my roof. Just in the middle of the night, I think I'm just going to get up and take a stroll on my roof. But that's what he does. 
David here, he's idle, he's not at the battle, not doing what the king is supposed to be doing, and now all of a sudden he can't sleep, so what does he do? He gets up, and I'm just going to go take a stroll on my roof. And of course, as he's up there, he's got this vantage point, and he sees this woman washing herself. Right? Now, you can't always control what goes in front of your eyes the first time. But I'll tell you what you can control the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth time. He ought not to have, you know, if you see something, you got to just be able to be quick to, to not, you don't look back again. There are, multi, there are a number of things that David did here that all led him down this bad path of committing this great sin. And, I mean, after all of these things happened, he still shouldn't have done it. But you can kind of see how the chain of events happened to get him to this point. Now, if he would have just been off at that battle, none of this would have happened. If he would have just been doing what he's supposed to be doing, and or or even if he didn't do that, if he would have just been keeping himself busy so that he wasn't just tossing and turning all night and just doing some hard work, this wouldn't have happened. He goes up on the roof. He sees it. If he would have just looked away, just just looked away, I shouldn't be looking at that. This wouldn't have happened. All these different things. But he sees her. He thinks she's beautiful. So then he calls about, you know, he sends to inquire, like, who is this girl? I want to find out who this is. And, um, and they tell him, is not this Bathsheba, in verse 3, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So even after he does all this stuff, and he finds out, hey, this is somebody's wife. Even if he got to this point, he should say, no. Okay, well, that's somebody's wife. I'm not going to act on this. That They're married. But no, he still continues. He says, and David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. Now, horrible sin. All of these different things, just, just the chain of events, one after the other, lead up to him committing this wicked sin. Even after he knows that she's the wife of Uriah. And then, so then what happens, though, is that David tries to cover everything up, right? Um, in, you could jump down to verse 13, because he finds out then that she's pregnant. So now he's got something to deal with. Now, see, at first he's like, you know, the king, he's up on his roof. Nobody knows what's going on. He sends probably just, like, just talks to one of his loyal people to find out what's going on so that it's not some big thing that everybody knows about. Right? He starts off doing this thing. It's a secret sin. There's not very many people know about this. Maybe one or two people, someone, you know, probably, again, probably people he has confidence in that, that are close to him that he's going to say, hey, you know, you know, Call her, call her enemy. And they don't even necessarily always know what the intent is, right? I mean, if the king just says, call this person unto me, they're going to do it, right? Well, he finds out that she's pregnant. Well, this is going to, this is going to be known now. Her husband is off to war. He comes home and finds out that, that she's, she, has a, she has a child in her womb. You know, he's going to know that something was going on. He's going to know this happened. So, David now needs to figure out, what he tries doing is trying to figure out a way where he can get off the hook. He doesn't want to be caught. He doesn't want his secret sin to be found out. It says in verse 13, it says, And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. This is the, the husband. So he calls the husband from the war. He calls him back home. And he's just saying, he's thinking, okay, I'm going to call this, this guy back. He can go spend some time with his wife, and then, and then no one will know. And then it would be normal and natural that she's pregnant, and no one will suspect that he was involved. So the first night he comes back, and this is a righteous man. And, and you know, Uriah, you may not know this, but he was one of David's, like, top 30 guys. He was a valiant man of war. He was a great warrior. He was loyal to David, and, and he was one of his top 30 guys. And this is how he treats him. And, and he invites him back. So first, he's, first thing he's thinking, okay, well, if I invite him back, you know, as long as he's here, as long as he's in the city, he'll go see his wife. But no, this guy has integrity. And, and, and what he says is, you know, his, uh, David's men told him, you know, Uriah didn't go home last night. He stayed out here. And he asks him, you know, Uriah, what are you doing, Uriah? Why didn't you go home? And he said, look, Joab is out in the field. My comrades, the soldiers are out in the field. The ark of God is out in the field. And he says, they're all out there. That's, and that's where he came from. And he's basically saying, like, that's where I should be. 
I'm not going to go and satisfy myself when all of my comrades, all of my friends, all the other soldiers are out there in, in, on the battlefield. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hold my, withhold myself from that. Hey, if they're all out there doing that, I'm going to just sit tight here. I'm not going to go see my wife, you know, until basically until the whole war is over and we all come home. That's, he was trying to be honorable. He's trying to just, you know, um, he's thinking about everybody else. That's what his mind's on. So David says, you know, now I'm sure David's getting nervous. And he's thinking, okay, well, wait here again. Wait here another night. So he calls them in and he eats with them and he gets them drunk. Now, should he have gotten him drunk? No. He's, see, David now, in his attempt to cover things up, he begins to sin more and more and more. And that's the way that, that when you have these secret sins and you start lying about stuff, you start building this web of deceit and you have to just end up sinning more and more and more and just, it just builds on each other. When, when you try to hide your sins and try to cover it up, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And that's what we see starting to happen here. So then... He's thinking, okay, well, I'm going to get him drunk. And when he's drunk, then he'll want to go home to his wife. Because now he won't have the restraint, and he won't be feeling as honorable as he would, you know, like he did last night. So I'm going to get him drunk. He gets him drunk, and he still doesn't go home to his wife. So then he sends him out. And it gets even worse. He sends, he puts a letter in Uriah's hand to give to Joab, the captain of the host. He gives him a letter. Inside of that letter, it's telling Joab to kill Uriah. He is, he is a messenger with his, own, with his own death sentence in his hand. And he was still an upright man. He didn't know that. But it proves he didn't open it up. He didn't try to open it up and read it and say, Oh, I wonder what David's trying to tell Joab. He did his job. He did his job with integrity. He was honest. He brought the message to Joab. And it was, his, it was his own death warrant. David gives that, that message to, to Joab. It says in verse 14, it says, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. So he's not hiding this at all. He's not covering this up. He's basically telling Joab, look, I want Uriah to die, and here's how you're going to do it. You're going to find the worst part of the battle, the one that you're struggling with the most, the one where the enemy is, is the most fortified and the most defensive, you know, and, and, and that is able to, to attack and, and be able to, um, to hurt us the most, you know, the, the hottest part, the worst part of the battle. And he said, I want you to put him right in the front of that, and then everyone else is back up and leave him there. Now, that's not exactly what Joab did. Joab had a little bit more integrity than that. Now, mind you, Joab doesn't know why all this is going on. Joab wasn't back. He doesn't know that David committed adultery with his wife. He doesn't know. All he knows is that, is that Uriah went to Jerusalem, he talked to David, and then he came back again. So, in all of this, Joab's basically following his orders. And even in his following the orders, we don't get any indication that they just all retreated from him. He did put him in the hottest part of the battle, but Uriah wasn't the only one to die. There were other people that died with him. And, um, but, but you can see this wickedness and, and how low David had gotten to try, just to try to cover up his, his original wicked sin to begin with. And that's why it says, um, you know, at the end of that chapter, as I mentioned already, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Well, yeah, look at the amount of sin that he did. Now we're going to see in chapter 12, and there's, you know, there's no reason to get any more into this story. We understand what he did. Everybody knows that this is wrong. This is not something that, that, that needs to be explained very, very deeply, right? You don't, you don't do what he did, and that was horrible. And this was a man of God. This was the king. This is, this is someone who, who was righteous, a man after God's own heart, and did this. So, Again, one of the reasons that this is being preached is that we all need to take heed. Every single one of us, we need to take heed to ourselves that we don't ever let ourselves get put into these situations, that we don't even get anywhere close to these horrible sins that David committed. Because if he was able to do it, a man of God is able to do that, anybody can do it. And we, can, we all need to take heed lest we fall. Okay, and there's a lot of lessons to be learned. We kind of went over some of them at the beginning. I'm going to go over them near the end. 
on what we can do to avoid this trap and to avoid this pitfall because adultery is terrible. Let's look at 2 Samuel, look at the next chapter, chapter number 12. Because now we're going to see God's going to send a prophet to speak to him and to rebuke him and just tell him that he's wrong and, and what he's been doing. And we see this story here. Look at verse number 1. It says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was kindled, was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. We're going to continue on with this in a minute, but I want to take a break here. We notice, though, in this story, get it, I mean, you have a rich man, a poor man. A rich man's got all kind of abundance, all kind of animals, you know, plenty of wealth. And the poor man, he's got one little lamb. And the lamb is his pet. And his lamb, it says, like, he's poor, but he brings up this lamb. The kids love it. It's a family pet. You know, he, he feeds it his own food, drinks out of his own cup. And, and, you know, he embraces him, and basically it was like a daughter to him, right? That's how close this animal was when he's saying, and he's giving him this story, right? And then some man comes to the rich man's house. The rich man doesn't, decides not to use any of his own wealth, any of his own animals, but he takes that guy's land, the poor man's, who has nothing but that one that's, that's basically like a daughter unto him, and he goes and takes that lamb and kills that lamb. David hears this story, and he's like, he's enraged. He's furious. He's, he's angry. He's saying, that guy's going to be put to death. Look, you need to, to and he's going to restore that lamb fourfold unto that guy, and that guy's going to be put to death. So here we have David. Isn't it interesting? He has no problem coming up with a judgment against these other people, against someone else and their wickedness. And his sin was yet way way worse. I mean, this story you gave of, of a rich man, you know, stealing this guy's lamb, yeah, that's bad. You shouldn't do that, right? But he didn't lay down with the guy's wife and then have her husband killed. Killing the stupid lamb is way, way, way not nearly as bad as what David did. Yet he gets angered and enraged by this, even though his sin was way worse. But that's where Nathan says, comes and says, look, you are that man. That's you. You're the one that has everything. You're the one that has an abundance of wives. You're the one that has all this stuff. And you take your Uriah's wife? Look at verse number 8. So then I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives. This is basically God saying, because in verse 7 he said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So this is a message from God to David. He says, I know, in verse, back in verse 7, um, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. God saying, look, I did all of this stuff for you. I gave you wealth. I made you the king of Israel. I made you the king of Judah. I gave you everything. And if that wouldn't have been enough for you, you could have come to me and I would have given you this and this and this. You would have, just would have given you more stuff. What do you do in taking someone else's wife? And notice he says here that now David is not physically the one that killed Uriah, right? I mean, he didn't, he didn't you know, shoot him or kill him or, 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 do, or lay his hands on him in any way. Yet he's the one that God holds responsible. He's the one that gave the order. 
he is very respectful. This is important to understand this too, that, that people think that, um, you know, when someone gives the orders and they're behind the scenes, just because their hands don't physically get bloody doesn't mean that they're not held responsible for those actions. David killed him, and it says he slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. David, in God's eyes, is guilty of murder. That's what he's guilty of. Verse number 10, he says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And this actually came to pass. This is a curse now that David is receiving for this wickedness that he had done. He's saying, you, you commit this adulterous act secretly, and you try to just brush it under the rug and just, and, and just cover it up and have this guy kill. He's like, it's going to come back to you, except this isn't just going to be some secret. This is going to be in the wide open. And this happens a few chapters later. I'll just read it for you in chapter 16. Um, his son Absalom actually wants to basically steal the kingdom away from his, from his own father, from David. And um, it says in verse 22 of chapter 16, it says, So they spread Absalom a tent on, upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. They set up a tent on the roof of the king's, of the king's house, the same roof where David went and looked at Bathsheba. Except this time, his son went in unto his wives, unto his concubines. And that was just up in this tent, just for everyone to know and for everyone to see, hey, look. And that, and that, that was part of David's punishment from God. He said, no, you think you're going to do this thing secretly? I'm going to make this come back against you, except much worse and in front of everybody. And everyone's going to know this. And then in verse 13, now this is important, though. This is key. In, in verse 13, it says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. So, David ends up receiving a lot for this. And, and this isn't the only thing. There's, there's other things that happen in David's life, life as a result of this sin. The sword does not depart out of his house. He loses children. He loses all kinds of things as a result of his actions here that are very grievous. But God's spares him in the sense that he allows him still to live. Now, the adulterer ought to be put to death by law anyway. David should have been put to death. And we're going to see that in a minute. But this is, see, this is what separates David from Saul and from, from many other characters as well. The Bible, he, he finally had this willingness to humble himself and, to, and just to accept that yes and to admit, I did wrong. I sinned. I sinned in the sight of the Lord. Now, that's complete opposite of, of Saul. When Saul was confronted on his sins, Saul was the king right before David. When Saul was confronted on his sins, he kept making up excuses. He would say, oh, no, well, you weren't here when he, when he offered up the sacrifice because he wasn't supposed to offer a sacrifice. And he, he just kept on was excuse after excuse after excuse. And God ended up taking the kingdom away from him and giving it unto David because of his actions and because of his unwillingness to humble himself and to, to just recognize that he sinned and to get right with God. But see, David sins, and this isn't the only sin that David does here. This is just the worst. And, but every time he has the heart where he does end up coming back to God and admitting it and, um, and repenting, essentially. And it says, um, and this is important just to understand just in your own life. When you're confronted with sin in your life, you know, how are you going to handle that? There's, there's many choices you have to deal with that. You can deal with it however you want. You can try to cover it up. You can try to do all these other things. But the right way to deal with it is just to humble yourself and to repent and just acknowledge and say, okay, I've done wrong. And however bad the sin may be, you know, whatever, whether it's like a small sin, a great sin, you have to admit, I've done wrong. You have to humble yourself and just admit it. And just say, God, I'm sorry I did wrong, and I'm not going to do it again. And, and mean it, I mean, obviously. I mean, you need, to, you need to just recognize that and move forward. That is what God expects of you. That's the only way that you'll get any mercy at all from God is if you deal with it that way. Um, if you don't do that, then he's going to come down on you even harder. Um, let's look at verse number 14. It says, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord, 
to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So David commits adultery. Bathsheba's pregnant by it with his son now. He kills Uriah, and what, what Nathan tells him here in verse 14, he says, look, because you've done this thing, because you've done this great sin, now you've given the enemies of the Lord an occasion to blaspheme. You're, and and this, this happens with Christians too. See, people look at you when you know, and, and that's basically what he's saying, is that you know, he's the king, and he's supposed to be representing the Lord, the Lord God. And he goes and does this thing. So he's saying because now the enemies, the other nations, the people they're fighting against, they can blaspheme the Lord through David's actions. They can say, well, look what David did. Yeah. And he's supposed to be just and righteous. And, they, you know, because the children of Israel were supposed to be fighting a righteous cause. They're supposed to be in these battles waging war against these heathen that are wicked. And they're supposed to be righteous. And if they're going out and presenting and saying, hey, we're fighting for the Lord. And the guy at the top is committing adultery and murder. That gives them occasion to blaspheme God and say, oh yeah, this is, this is what represents God? And why would they want to follow that? It's the same way today when a, a Christian, when a known Christian, someone knows you and says, you know what? I know so-and-so is a Christian. I know David. I know Pastor Burson is a Christian. He's a pastor. He's doing right. And if I go out and I do some, some wicked sin, I go out and I'm hanging out at the bar and I'm getting drunk, people are going to see that and they're going to be like, why should I listen to a word that he says? Why should I go to that church? Why should I believe? Hey, why should I be a Christian? Why should I? Hey, if that's what Christianity produces, if that's what a man of, a man of God does, then I don't want to have anything to do with God. And that's what people think. Now, it's not right for them to judge God based on the actions of a person. However, God holds us responsible for bringing a bad name upon him through our own actions. Because people do see that, and that is how people act, and we know that's how people act. So it's that, it's that much more important when you're known, when people know that, hey, you're a Christian, they're going to be looking at you a lot closer than they look at everybody else. Because when people, especially people that don't like Christianity, they don't like God, they're going to be looking for any little thing where you screw up and you mess up because they're, oh, yes, I thought you were a Christian. People say that all the time. Oh, yeah, I thought you, you know, I thought you believed the Bible. I thought you believed this, but here you are doing that. And, and, and it does destroy your credibility if you are just caught in sin, if you're just out doing wicked sin. I mean, whether you're caught or not, you shouldn't be doing it. But, but when, when it comes to light that you're doing wicked things, your credibility is shot and you are bringing a reproach unto the name of Christ. And... Because of David's action, because he allowed the enemy to blaspheme, he says, you're going to lose that child. That child is not going to make it. That child, and the child died. God took that child. And you say, well, that's not fair. Well, David shouldn't have done what he did. It's David's fault. It's not the child's fault. It's David's fault. But our sins, especially sins as grievous as this, have, have far-reaching impacts. You're right, I didn't do anything wrong. Right, was doing what was right. He's not fighting for the king. He was not fighting for God. And because of David's sin, because of David's wickedness, he loses his life. These bad sins have, have a, a far-reaching impact. More than more than, and, and you know what? I'm sure David, David didn't want to kill Uriah first, but because he so desperately didn't want it to be known, he was he was brought to that point. It was horrible. Adultery is an extremely serious sin. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 6. The Bible puts the death penalty on adultery. Back in Leviticus 20, the Bible says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. That was God's law. That's the way he deals with it. A far cry from where we're at today in this country. The death penalty. And I've said it in other sermons, I'll say it again. If people thought that they would be put to death for cheating on their spouse, there would be way less adultery going on these days than there is. But because it's, it's promoted in the culture, hey, the television, the movies, people committing adultery all the time, and it's not a big deal, and then you get to learn the backstory, and you start feeling sympathetic for these adulterers and these adulteresses that deserve to be put to death for their crimes, and you start thinking, oh, but I feel sorry for them. Oh, their husband didn't really love them that much. Oh, their wife didn't give them enough attention. 
Baloney. That's garbage. You get married, you make a vow unto that person, you better not be thinking of another man. You better not be thinking of another woman. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, are you there? Proverbs chapter 6, look at verse number 25. Proverbs 6, 25. The Bible reads, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. You're saying, look, if you see a beautiful woman, don't lust after her in your heart. And I don't care if you say, oh, well, it's not a table, it's this movie star or this actress. Lust not after her in your heart. It doesn't matter if you think she's a table or not. What's going on in your heart, it's going to start in your heart, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to fester, and it's going to build, and it's going to get to the point to where eventually you might end up making some actions on that. And it's going to start where nobody sees it. It's going to start in your heart. People don't go off just immediately just saying, oh, I'm going to go out and commit adultery today. No, it all starts somewhere. It all starts a lot less serious in your own mind than that. You just start thinking, oh, well, I can look another way, but I'm not doing anything. I'm just looking. That's wickedness, and that's a sin. The Bible says, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, and neither let her take thee with her eyelids. And this is really a very, very, very similar, because, I mean, lust in your heart over someone is basically covetousness. You're coveting another man's wife or just another woman that's other than your spouse. When you're coveting somebody else, um, this lines up with my sermon that I did uh, um, about covetousness and Achan. And you remember the sin of Achan? Uh, the sin of adultery basically starts the exact same way. It's going to start with your eyes. If you remember Achan, he saw, the, he saw the goods, and then he coveted them in his heart, and then he took them. Adultery is going to be the exact same way. It's going to start with your eyes. You're going to look at another person, whether it be a man or a woman. Whatever, you know, if you're, if you're married, you know, if you're, you're a man, you're looking at another woman. It's going to start with your eyes. It's going to start with you just looking at someone else. And then your thoughts start going. And you guys start thinking, oh, what would it be like to be married to that person? Or, oh, that's a beautiful person. I, you know, and, and, and the wickedness just starts going. And it starts with you just, just putting your eyes in the wrong place. And, and not, you know, like I said, you can see things and they can pop up. You just need to, to, to clear, your, clear your eyes and not keep gazing. And not take extra looks. Just look. If it happens... You have to have the strength. You have to have the fortitude to just, to just and, and you have to have a purpose in your heart not to keep looking. But it's wickedness to, to look on someone else. And, and maybe it's not the beauty. Okay, maybe with women, I, you know, I don't, men and women are different. Men kind of just, it's a physical thing and they just see it and it's just, you know, that lust comes that way. Maybe with women it's, oh, this is a really good man. I wonder what it would be like to be married to him. You know, and, and they start thinking bad about their husband. That's wickedness. Look at verse number 26 of, of Proverbs 6. It says, For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. And you need to keep, keep note of that. The adulteress will hunt for the precious life. There are people out there literally hunting for the precious life. There are adulterers. There are, there are women and men that are wicked, and that they're specifically looking out people to destroy their lives. And they may not see it as destroying their life, but they're looking to, to go destroy marriages, and they're looking for men that are already taken, and they're hunting. Hunting is not, oh, I stumbled into this, and this is some person that I knew back when we were friends. No, they're hunting. And you need to be aware of that. And the whorish woman is going to bring a man to a piece of bread. It's going to make you poor. It's going to make you broke. It's going to ruin your life. The Bible says in verse 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. And this is great wisdom. He's saying, look, when someone is poor and they're hungry and they just need to eat, and that person goes and steal, steals, yeah, it's wrong to steal food. It's always wrong, whether you're hungry or not. Whether you don't have food or whether you have food, it's always wrong to steal. But he's not going to be despised if he is hungering and he needs to get food and he goes and steals food. People aren't going to look at that person and despise that person because he stole. Right? I mean, he might have to pay things back and he's going he's to get, you know, um, he's going to have to deal with, with the consequences of his actions. But it says, um, it says in verse 31, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. Now he's going to compare this to someone who commits adultery, right? Verse 32, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it 
destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Look, when someone steals bread, you say, okay, well, I'm going to restore that sevenfold. When someone sleeps with your wife, you can't give that back. He's saying, you're going to destroy your own soul. I know this. If anyone ever attempted to lay down with my wife, I'm going to kill him. And that's what's going to happen because I'm not going to put up with it. I mean, hopefully that never ever, God forbid that would ever happen. And this is why I don't want to preach a sermon because I don't even like thinking about it. But he's saying, look, the rage of man, look, no amount of money, no one's going to say, oh, I slept with your wife, but here, I'm going to give you $1,000, or here's $10,000. No, it doesn't make it okay. That's not going to satisfy it. I'm going to expect you to be put to death, and I'm going to want to do it. And you know what? That's the way they did it back in the Old Testament. That's the way they did it in, God, in, in, in his time, when a man would be stoned to death, and it was going to be the person affected is going to throw that first stone at him. That's how they dealt with wickedness. And adultery is wicked. And don't, don't you ever think for a second that there is anything that's not so bad about adultery. Adultery is, is it's got to be one of the worst sins. And I'm going to jump, skip to this point because it's probably one of the worst sins that somebody could commit. You think about the defiling that goes on in a marriage. In a marriage, you have total trust in your spouse. You commit yourselves to each other. All you have is your word. You give your word unto them, they give your word unto us. You have somebody that you should be able to trust completely with everything in your life, everything about you. You lay it all on the line for them and they lay it all on the line for you. And you two are together and you become one flesh. You become one person. And to destroy that trust and to take that and, and, and make yourself one with another person is, is so wicked. It's so selfish. Do you have no love for your spouse? Do you have no love for your children? If you have children and you commit this type of an act? You commit yourselves unto your spouse. And it's supposed to be, you're supposed to be with each other for all times. For better and for worse. And what happens is people go through those times that are for worse. They're going through bad times, they're struggling, they're arguing, they're fighting, or whatever. There's things that are not going bad, and they forget that they made that vow that said, oh yeah, I said for better and for worse. It's not just for better, it's not just when everything is roses and everything's great. No, it's when we're, it's when we're going through the hard times too. Hey, we've committed ourselves to each other. We're not going to go out and try to, try to find comfort in the arms of a stranger. You make yourself a liar when you go out and do that because you made a promise. And you're also going to bring reproach unto the name of Christ. And you say, oh, Pastor Burns, we looked at all the, these Old Testament scriptures, but surely in the New Testament things aren't that bad, right? Turn to Matthew 5. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to see what Jesus has to say about adultery. We're going to see if, oh, in the New Testament, if things aren't quite that bad anymore. I know in the Old Testament they had, they had the death penalty. But, you know, Jesus came and made everything okay, and we're free from the law, so we don't got to worry about that anymore, right? Look at Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse number 27. We'll see what Jesus has to tell you about this. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 27. He says, you have, heard it, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So he's saying, look, you heard it before, before they said, thou shalt not commit adultery. He's saying, but you know what I'm saying unto you? He said, if you even look at a woman to, and, and to, to lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. Jesus is taking it one step further. He's saying, look, not only should you not commit adultery, the actual act, he said, if you just look at a woman and lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. That's the way that he looks at it. Let's keep reading. Verse number 25, 29, he says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. He said, if you got a problem with this, if your right eye offends thee, pluck it out. It is, and, and cast it from thee. It is for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, 
cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. And this is something that's not very popular, but it's what the Bible says. With so many divorces uh, today, and people just getting divorced and remarried, divorced and remarried, they think everything's just fine. And they think, a lot of people even think they're doing right by God and the Bible, that there's no problem with it. Jesus Christ just said, look, if you get, if you get divorced, and, and this is taught, and I'm not going to go through this very much, but it says, whosoever shall put away his wife, you know, if you're going to get divorced, give her, give her a writing of divorcement. But he says, but I say unto you that anybody, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication. Now, fornication happens prior to marriage. Fornication is not the same as adultery. It's the same act, but the word fornication is used outside of marriage. And the word adultery is used when you're married. So he's saying the only time that people were able to get a divorce that was ever uh, acknowledged as being le legitimate at all is if you thought you're getting married to a virgin and before you even consummate your marriage, you find out maybe she's pregnant or maybe she's got some kind of disease. Or you find out that, no, she actually wasn't, she, she actually wasn't a virgin and, and I thought that she was. And, and that was the, the only grounds for divorce that was ever given in the Bible that says, okay, then you can have a So he says here, Jesus qualifies, says that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for that one cause, saving for that one cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. So he's saying, look, you want to get divorced? Yo, you get divorced? Well, if you go out and get married, now you just commit adultery. You're still bound by that oath. If it's not recognized in God's eyes as a legitimate divorce, you're basically still bound by the law until your ex-husband dies. He's saying you're not allowed to just go out, get married, get divorced, get remarried again, get divorced, get remarried. No. This is serious. You need to take that vow seriously. Now, you may be thinking to yourself today that there is no way in the world that I would ever commit adultery against my spouse. And, and... Amen! I, I hope that's the way that everybody's thinking tonight. I mean, this is, this is not a bizarre, but, but and I hope that's the way you always think. Right? I mean, this is something that should never even, this should never once even cross your mind to, to, to commit an adulterous act against your spouse. Not even one time. You should never let that, cross your, let that thought cross your head, ever, even once. But I'm going to give you, because it's important that we keep our heart as far away from this wickedness as possible. This is, this is, in my opinion, I've said it before, one of the most grievous sins that you could commit. The sin of adultery is one of the worst things that you could possibly do. And um, we need to make sure that we keep ourselves as far away from this as possible. We need to keep our families strong. So... How are we going to do this? And, and I've, got, I've got a few, a few points here. Number one, stay busy. We saw that from King David. right? We'll go back to that story of David. He wasn't busy. He had free time on his hand. He had a bunch of idleness. And what happens is when you have nothing to do, it gives your heart time to, to just kind of come up with whatever. And, and, you know, this kind of goes for all sin in general. When you just have an abundance of free time and you find yourself, well, I don't really have much to do, a lot of times you'll find yourself getting into things that, that, that are sin that you shouldn't be doing anyways because you're just thinking, oh, I don't know, what should I do today? I don't know. And you just kind of find yourself doing things you probably ought not to be doing. And, and with adultery especially, obviously, I mean, if you don't have any time to... to to be with someone other than your family, then you're not going to be finding time to commit adultery. It's just not going to happen. Keep yourself busy. And especially with the things of God. Especially doing things that are righteous because if you're, doing, if you're keeping yourself busy with that stuff, that's only going to help build up your spirit anyways and help strengthen you to, to just to be able to, to ward off any type of lustful thoughts 
or, or any types of things that might be going through your mind. When, when, you're, when you're in God's Word and, and, you're, and you're really walking the way that you ought to be, you'll be strengthening yourself to, to, to be stronger against um, these types of temptations. But keep yourself busy. Number two, never allow yourself to be put in a position where you are alone with someone of the opposite gender. And this is important. If someone is not your spouse or not an immediate family member, you know, like I'm, it's okay for me to be alone with my mother somewhere, right? It's like we go out shopping or something. It's not a big deal. But other than that, right, other, other than like your sister or your brother or your mom or dad or someone like that, someone that, that's that, that close to your family members, right, someone, someone in that type of situation, don't ever let yourself be alone with, with someone of the opposite gender. Because uh, I'll tell you what, my wife does not have any male friends that she just goes out and has lunch with or goes out and has dinner with or whatever. If, if anyone's going to be seeing anybody like that, we're going to be together. There is not going to be a time that, that and it just goes the same way for me. I do not have any female friends that I just go out and, hey, let's just go out and get some lunch together. There are none like that. And in this church, even as pastor, if someone ever has an issue and you want to come to me and you want to talk to me and you want to go through something or whatever, hey, I don't mind doing that, but guess what? My wife is going to be there. We are not going to go behind some closed door somewhere and I'm not going to put myself in that position. And it's just a wise thing to do. Now you say, what, do you not trust your wife? No, I trust my wife. Of course I do, but I'm not going to give occasion to sin. I'm not going to even allow it to ever, to ever even become a thought, so who cares? It's just not going to happen. And um, what, what ends up happening, though, is when you're not that diligent about it, you start, you know, people start forming these friendships and these relationships. Let's say, let's say I didn't care. Well, go ahead and go out, and she's got this, this male friend. And maybe he's even married, right? Oh, well, we're both married, so who cares? Not a big deal, right? They, all go, they go out to lunch. They go out to lunch, and they, start, and they talk, and they're friends. And now they're starting to build a bond together. Friendship, right? Friendship. But then what happens is one of them, maybe he starts having problems in his life. Maybe he starts having problems with his spouse. And now all of a sudden, his confidant, his, his great friend that he can trust and rely on, now he's starting to build a much, a much deeper relationship with my wife. And, I mean, that's where people get feelings, start to, start to come up. And, and you get in these situations, you should never be in those situations to begin with. Look, there is no, and, and it happens, okay? Look, you can say, oh, well, no, my spouse is the only person for me, and you know, that you know, God made that person individually for me. And I hope that's the case. Amen. I hope that's true. But everybody is human, and everybody is capable to succumb to these types of thoughts or these types of feelings that come up. And it's, it's an extremely dangerous situation that comes up. Most people who get divorced and then get remarried right away, and I mean, I know this for a fact, and anybody, I mean, you know, you pro, everybody here probably knows at least five people in their lives that have been divorced and are remarried. Just because that's the society we live in. And that's at a minimum. I know more than that, but I'm just saying, like, and, and I can think of example after example after example where the divorce happens. Oh, guess what happens? Now I'm getting married to my coworker. You think there wasn't anything going on before that? You think that those seeds weren't being planted and that relationship wasn't being developed and, then, and, and you think that's going to help when you're having marriage problems at all that you're becoming closer and closer to this other person? Is that really going to help your marriage, becoming closer to someone else of the opposite gender? If you need to get closer to your wife or to your husband, do you think that's going to help you by confiding in someone of the opposite gender and getting closer to them? Do you think that's going to drive you and your wife together? It's not going to happen. That's foolishness. And the best way to head that off is just to not allow it to at all to begin with. And just, you guys, you know, you ought to just be able to do that and, and just out of, for, for the sake of your own marriage, don't allow these things to, to ever even happen. I mean, if you, if you take away the occasions, like David, if he was busy, if he wasn't just strolling around on the roof, if, you know, if there's all these different things he wasn't doing, none of that would have happened. None of it would have. And these are, these are some tips I'm trying to give you that, hey, 
you can you could remove the occasion for these things to even happen. Um, number three, you need to be like Job and make a covenant with your eyes. A commit, you know, you have to understand and purpose in your heart that when you see something, you're not going to keep gazing. You're not going to take that second look, and then third, you're not going to keep looking back. When you know men, when when that when that when that woman walks by and she's wearing next to nothing, and she's walking down the street and she's like in a bikini or whatever, you know, don't just stare and mouth draw and everything. And how, how do you think that makes your wife feel anyways? If you're over there and you're just staring and gawking at some other woman, how do you think your wife is going to feel about that, whether she's with you or not? If she were to see you, just imagine, let's say, let's say she's not with you at all. Say, oh, well, she's not here, so I'm going to look. It's a secret sin, right? And no one might ever know that, but you know what that's going to do? That's going to, that's going to affect your heart. You start doing those things, you start taking in that, that looking at other women, looking at other men, that will affect your heart. And it's going to drive you further away from your wife. That's a disgrace to do that, and, and, and it's, it's, a, it's shameful, and it's shameful to your wife. I mean, just, just anytime you see something like that, think about, how would I feel if my wife just started staring at some man? The way that you are staring at this woman. Think about that. And with ladies, it goes the same way here. Just, just put yourself, if you have a problem, if you like, oh man, this guy's, you know, whatever, he's hot. And I was like, look at him. How would you feel if your husband was doing the same thing about, it, about another woman? You know, put yourself in that situation and, and understand that that's hurtful. And you know, there's a lot of ladies that say, oh, it doesn't bother me. Or like, oh, it doesn't bother me. Look, deep down inside, I, I know that it does. There is that, that feeling of rejection of you're not good enough for them and everything else when you're just staring at somebody else. Make a covenant with your eyes. And look, I get, and you know, guys are probably, it's a harder thing to deal with than women. It's, it's part of our sinful nature to, to do that and to look. And it's, and it's part of our culture. And you got, you know, you got other guys saying, oh, hey, man, check this out. Look at this. You have to be above that. You have to be better than that. You have to, to train yourself to just avoid it. Just don't look at it. Move your eyes. You don't have to keep looking at those things. It's going to go into your heart. And um, let's see, my next, my fourth point here, and this is, this is probably the most important one. If you want to avoid adultery, if you want to avoid this stuff, you need to love your spouse. And what do I mean by that? You, you need to go out of your way to do nice things for them. Don't ever say something bad about your spouse to someone else. The way that you view your spouse in your eyes, I mean, that that's... How do I want to say this? If you want your marriage to last, if you want your marriage to work, you need to have that love for your spouse. And again, the love is not just a feeling. The feeling is there. It should be there. You know, it ought to be there. And, and I love that feeling. I love that feeling of love for my wife. But it's more than that. And, and if a marriage also requires some work, it doesn't all just come easy. It never does. You need to be able to invest time into it. You need to invest, invest your life and your soul into it. You need to pour out yourself onto your spouse. You need to be able to, to if things are going bad, hey, overcome evil with good. That's what the Bible says. You know, maybe, maybe there's one person in a marriage that's just doing everything bad and wrong and they shouldn't be doing this stuff. You need to overcome that. You can decide, look, people end up getting in these bitter relationships and their marriage turns sour. And the other person, you know, no one ever really wants to take that first step and say, you know what, I'm just going to start treating my wife, I'm just going to start treating my husband really well. And if, and if someone could just swallow their pride, he, humble themselves, right? Just one person in a relationship. Let's say, let's say there's, a, there's, a, there's a husband, and he's a real jerk, and he's just always mean, and he just feels like he, never, he doesn't love me, doesn't care about me, everything else. So then, in retaliation, as a wife, you feel like, well, I'm not going to do anything for him, and as you will see how that works out, you know, and then this kind of this back and forth thing, right? Well... If the wife were to say, and again, I mean, it doesn't make it go either way. If the wife were to say, you know what, I'm just going to work really hard 
and I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do all kinds of nice things for him. Well, you know what's probably gonna happen? The the jerkiness of the husband probably isn't gonna be happening so much because he's gonna start, or he ought to at least, start feeling guilty for for you know mistreating his wife if he's mistreating her, and start thinking, you know what, she's really doing a lot of great things for me. She's doing all this stuff. And then, and then that could kind of help repair that relationship that shouldn't have gotten that bad to begin with. And it's, it goes the same way. I mean, the husband can do the same thing. You have a wife, man, she's not listening to me, she's not doing anything, you know, all this other stuff. So now I'm going to be upset with her and then, you know, whatever, I'm not going to do anything for her, everything else. Look, you can overcome that by, by taking that step and saying, you know what, I'm going to see, I, I love my wife, I love my husband, I'm going to do whatever I can to, to, to please them. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about a husband just, just submitting to the wife because that's wicked, that's wrong. But I am talking about loving your wife and doing nice things for her. Do nice things for your husband. Do things that you know is going to make him happy. These are important in a marriage. And, and what I said earlier, I started to get into this a little bit, but don't ever say something bad about your spouse because what happens is when you start focusing about negative things, and this could be any negative, negative thing in your life. I mean, it could be your, your job. You know, if you start complaining and complaining and complaining about your job, that's not going to fix anything. That's not going to solve anything. You're just going to be in this mindset of, man, this is just really bad. When you have your spouse, you know, you ought not to be saying to your friends and saying to your family members and saying, you know what, my, you know, my husband or my wife, yeah, she doesn't do any of this stuff. And, and I'll tell you what, this gets really dangerous too. When, when you start involving, especially family members, and this is one of the reasons why I think divorces um, end up in divorce, marriages end up in divorce within the first two years of marriage, is because, look, every marriage requires a lot of adjustments, a lot of things are changing in your life, you know, you're used to being single, um, probably used to living alone, or whatever, and you, you, you come together, you, you, you get married, and there's changes. You're living with somebody now. You're, you're right up in each other's face. And, you know, the way that you do things isn't always the same. And you're getting used to, to being married to each other and kind of falling into your roles. And there's going to be disagreements and there's going to be fights and these things happen. It's normal. And those things are natural. But what doesn't help that situation ever is to go and talk to your mother or your sister or, you know, like your family member and say, Oh, man, my husband's this and, he, you know, he doesn't do this. Also. Because guess what? They're going to be on your side. And they're going to be giving you advice. And when it gets really bad is when your husband, your, your, you know, your mother or your wife, or your, sister, no, your, wife, your mother or your sister, or like some other, you know, someone else you're confiding in, they're not safe. Or they're really worldly. And they're going to start giving you bad advice. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, you, know, you don't need that. And they're going to start giving you all kinds of counsel. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, I'm on your side. But look, the other thing you got to remember is there shouldn't be sides. When, when you and your spouse come together, you are one flesh. You shouldn't have a my side and his side, or a his side and her side. It is, we're on the same team. And you got to remember that. Your husband and wife, you are together. You're on the same team. You got to think of it, hey, this is our side. How are we going to be the best together? How are we going to benefit from this? It's not, how, what can I get what I want, and he's getting what he wants. No, we need to get what we want together. And when you start talking bad about people to, to, uh, to someone else, to your friend, to your family, or whatever, especially these days, you end up usually getting some very horrible advice. And um, sometimes it's even advice to just go and leave your spouse and you deserve better, you need to go find someone else. And um, it's a very dangerous position to put yourself in. The last thing that you need if you're experiencing difficulties in your marriage is anybody telling you to end the marriage. That is the worst counsel that you can get. You need to do what you can to make that marriage better. And it's not, it shouldn't be a, a, a finger pointing thing. You start pointing the finger, you're not going to get anywhere. It's not going to help anything. That's not how you resolve issues. It's not just saying, well, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, you know, look, if you care about your spouse, you care about your relationship, you care about your marriage, you need to just get past that and figure out how you can, how you can make things better and, and just start loving your spouse and, um, and doing that which is right. And um, 
this is a big deal. You don't, you don't want your heart to be just continuing going down a wrong path. Um, and, you know, this tends to be a problem typically more with the ladies than with the men. And um, guys have a tendency more to keep things to themselves, just about everything. You know, it's not like we talk about our feelings that much and, oh, this is bothering me. It's just kind of the way guys are. Whereas women are a lot more likely to, to, to want to talk to their friends and chat and gossip and just do, you know, like all these things. And they're more open and, and they're more emotional and there's a lot more things going on. Um, so it's, it tends to be more of a problem with women. But um, man, I lost my notes here. It tends to be more of a problem with women, but another reason why there tends to be a lot, lot more problems, I think, in marriages is that the, the culture, the American culture and the brainwashing of women into thinking that the man is not the head of the household. And that is, a, that is something that has been going on for a long time in our country, and it ends up causing fights. Because when you have two people who both think that they're the head of the household, trying to make decisions or trying to you know, make things happen, and... It's fine if, you, if you're always agreeing, but you're not always going to agree. There's, there's going to be disagreements and things. But, you know, when, when you have that and people are supposed to be like, when, when you think of yourself as just, well, we're both, we are both equal in making this decision making for our, for our lives and for our family, then there's going to be problems and you're going to have strife there. And... Um, I think the vast majority of problems that ladies have in Christian marriages today is just accepting and embracing that role. And, and you know, you shouldn't allow pride and indignation to be in your heart just because the world endorses a loud and stubborn and, um, you know, basically what, what the world promotes is a woman whose success is achieved by being as much like a man as she can, by going out to work and by doing these things and wearing pants and doing, you know, whatever, like just just doing everything that's like a man, that is what the world today is, is exalting for a woman. When, you know, a woman should embrace her femininity and embrace what it means to be a wife and a mother, and there's so many great things to do there. But look, all of that, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here. The, the last point on that was, you know, is, is, is really, it's to love your spouse, okay? To avoid adultery, you know, we, you need to keep yourself busy, keep yourself busy with the things of God, we need to um, don't allow yourself in a position where you're going to be alone with people of the other gender. Make a covenant with your eyes. Don't be looking on the wrong things. And, and love your spouse. I mean, do the extra things. You know, and, and, and this is something you just have to repeat over and over again and just, and just bring back in your mind, especially the longer you've been married, the longer you've been together. you gotta remember, you got to just say, hey, and, and as maybe things start coming up, you know, it's easy to coast for a while and things are going great. But then when, when you notice things starting to go bad, and you say, why are, we, why are we starting to argue more? Why are we starting to fight more? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, what, 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 what would my wife love to have right now? What would my husband love right now? And just, and just remember, hey, this is my spouse. I love my spouse. I don't want to lose her. I don't want, to, I don't want this to end. And, and that's the way we ought to be. And, um, you know, adultery is, is a wicked, wicked, wicked sin. And... Um, you ought not to ever allow this to, to creep into your life and just be vigilant about this. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible and for your words here, God. Lord, I pray that, that this sin would never, ever rear its ugly head with anybody in this room tonight, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to love our spouses and, and to, uh, to humble ourselves in our own situations to be able to, to get past this, to overcome evil with good, dear Lord. Help us to to be wise in our dealings, to be wise in the way that we, um, that we deal with other people, um, with, with who we spend our time with, whether it's co-workers, whether it's friends, dear Lord, help us never to, to build these strong bonds with people of the opposite gender when we're already married, dear Lord. Um, help us to, to just be wise in, in dealing with that. And we love you and we thank you for, for your mercy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.